Hi, this is Carrie Bible, tour guide at Hollywood Forever Cemetery, and I'm here for another installment, the ninth one, of Tour Talk. This week we are going to talk about the great Peter Lorre. I'm filming this the night before because I have a private tour tomorrow morning, June 27th, and today was his birthday. He was born on June 26th, 1904. So we'll delve all into Peter Lorre's life in just a moment. But one thing I do want to emphasize, uh, Close Up the Cat is doing extremely well for all of you who have been asking. Thank you so much. Um, another big Close Up the Cat fan in San Francisco is actually sending him treats. So he's going to have some more treats being shipped in from another city. And uh, Close Up made a press announcement this week because he is my acting press agent. And he has announced that um, I'm doing private tours for now. And of July 11th, the tours for the public will resume. Um, you do need to book them in advance because I have to cap attendance. And suffice it to say, mask wearing and social distancing is um, required. And you can find out more information at cemeterytour.com. But Close Up did an excellent job handling the press. And if you have any further questions, just let me know. All right, on to Peter Lorre. So Peter Lorre was very interested in acting from a very, very early age. And he started out in the theater. He was born in Hungary and started working in the theater in Austria as a young man. And then in 1925, he moved to Berlin. And he was originally born Ladislav Lowenstein, but changed his name to Peter Lorre when he got to Berlin, which was much shorter and, of course, marquee friendly. And in Berlin, he worked with Bertolt Brecht and really took the city by storm with his incredibly intense and powerful stage performances. It wouldn't be long, of course, before the film industry came calling. And by 1931, Peter Lorre was cast in what I consider to be his signature film, M, as in the letter M, directed by Fritz Lang in 1931. In this film, Peter Lorre plays a serial killer who goes after young children. The film caused an international sensation when it was released. People around the world were terrified of Peter Lorre. Uh, there are stories that if people saw him in the streets of Berlin after M was released, they would grab their child, start screaming, and run down the streets to get away from Peter Lorre. So he truly terrified people. and. M put him on the map. And what makes M so terrifying is not really what you see, it is what you do not see. For example, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the film Jaws and the opening scene where the woman goes in the water and the shark eats her and you don't see the shark or the blood or anything like that. Well, in M, there's a scene where Peter Lorre sees a very young girl in the streets. Why she has no parent, who knows? But anyway, he sees her in the streets in this film and he buys her a balloon. And then he takes her by the hand, they walk down the street, they round a corner, the scene fades out. It fades up and you just see the balloon go up in the sky. So you don't need to see what happens. What you fill in with your imagination is far more terrifying. And Fritz Lang was using this technique decades before Spielberg would apply it in Jaws. And again, M was just a terrific film and still holds up very well today on DVD. Well, there was a lot of turmoil, of course, going on in Europe at the time, and as the Nazis rose to power, Peter Lorre was warned to get out quickly. So he went on to Paris, and while in Paris, he had a very rough time. He couldn't find very much work. Well, he was contacted by a British director who had changed Peter Lorre's life forever, named Alfred Hitchcock. Peter Lorre went to a meeting with Alfred Hitchcock, and he barely spoke any English, and Peter just sat there and nodded and smiled a lot, which led Hitchcock to assume that he did speak English, and hired Peter Lorre for the 1934 film The Man Who Knew Too Much. And Peter Lorre quickly would stay up all night learning English, trying to learn his lines. He was very, very dedicated to the role, and of course, it paid off. And after that, Peter Lorre was offered a contract in Hollywood. So he went out to Hollywood, and he really, in a way, he loved Hollywood because the sunshine, the palm trees, totally different environment from Berlin. The problem, however, was that Peter Lorre, because of M, 
he was sort of typecast in these roles of these deranged, crazy villains. And he hated that. He wanted to show that he was much more of an actor and there was so much more he could do as an artist. And he didn't always get that opportunity. Well, his first English role was The Man Who Knew Too Much. And then when he got to America, he was, uh, again, typecast so much. And he wound up at Fox in the Mr. Moto series. Now, he played a Japanese detective, even though he's Hungarian. And, of course, it's inappropriate by our standards today, but that's sort of the way things were at that time. So the Mr. Moto films were very, very popular, and Peter Lorre made about nine of those. But again, he hated the work, and he felt very creatively frustrated. And also, making matters more complicated here was... Of course, the fact what was going on back home in Germany, Peter Lorre felt very disconnected from his family and his homeland, and he felt just devastated at what was happening in World War II, and it was a very frustrating time. He gave anti-Nazi speeches on the radio, and he did everything that he possibly could to help out with the war effort. And... He wound up leaving Fox because he was very unhappy with the Moto films and the other roles he was asked to play. And he wound up at Warner Brothers, which would probably be the happiest time of Peter Lorre's life and career. At Warner Brothers, he was partnered with Humphrey Bogart and Sidney Greenstreet in what would become a blockbuster in 1941, John Huston's The Maltese Falcon. Incidentally, John Huston is at Hollywood Forever as well. That's a different story for a different day. But anyway... Uh, so the Maltese Falcon really gave Peter a whole new lease on life. And then he wound up in Casablanca. He's not in it very long, but he really makes an impact. And Peter Lorre may not have been, like, devastatingly handsome like, say, Errol Flynn, but he had an incredible screen presence. His eyes would almost bore right through you. He had a nasal voice and a very sort of haunting tortured presence that really made him an arresting character actor. Well, he starred in many more films at Warner Brothers, and he was there about, I think, about five years or so, and that was just a great period of time in Peter Lorre's life. But unfortunately, he was not renewed at Warner Brothers. World War II had come to an end. A lot of things were changing, so Peter Lorre started working in radio. And then... He wanted his independence, so he founded his own production company. And he was trying so hard to get quality material because, again, he was so tired of being typecast. Well, the problem with that was he had a terrible time finding the right material. And then he hired a business partner to run the day-to-day -day operations of the company, and this person wound up embezzling and really destroying everything. And... Peter wasn't really watching over the books and the financial details, and next thing you know, he was completely bankrupt by 1949, and this business partner had really done a tremendous amount of damage. So Peter Lorre left for Europe. He had divorced his first wife, Celia Levski, and married another woman named Karen Verne, who was a German actress. Well, he went over to Europe, and he was, of course, very devastated at all the damage and all the horrors he saw that were still very present from World War II. And he wanted to make a film about this, so he made a film called The Lost One. And Peter had a very troubled production. He wrote, directed everything, this film. And also, when it came out, it was met with a combination of either derision or contempt or just kind of ignored. And Peter Lorre felt like the German people had sort of turned their backs on him. But in reality, after all the stuff that had happened in World War II, they really just didn't want to see a film that was revisiting the horrors they had just experienced in real life. So Peter was very devastated and he felt his masterpiece was rejected. Also, his wife Karen Verne left him so he's been bankrupt, his wife left him, his film did not succeed. He's having a very, very rough time. So he went back to Hollywood and he got a call from an old friend, director John Huston, who offered Peter Lorre a role in the film Beat the Devil with Humphrey Bogart. He made that and it helped his career again. 
Peter also worked in the burgeoning medium of television, and he would make the record books in 1954 as the very first James Bond villain in the 1954 TV version of Casino Royale. Then Peter went on to character roles, but really kind of became a parody of his former self with the bulgy eye master of menace thing that he hated so. And he wound up in family-oriented type movies like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea or Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. And he really hated these films and felt, again, he was constantly feeling creatively frustrated. He wanted to be a leading man. He wanted these high-quality artistic roles. And sadly, he wasn't getting them. And also, by the way, along this path, when Peter was much younger, he'd had an operation that did not go well, and he became addicted to morphine. So throughout his life, Peter was a morphine addict, and he hid this from his co-workers, the studio. His family and friends knew about it, but Peter Lorre managed to keep this from the general public and, of course, his colleagues. And this problem continued to plague him throughout his life. And at the end of his life, Peter Lorre was very bloated, very depressed, he married for the third time a woman named um, Anna Marie. They had a daughter named Catherine, and their marriage was very troubled as well. And they were actually getting a divorce and had a divorce hearing on the day Peter Laurie died. He was only 59 years old. And of course, he never made the hearing, and he and Anna Marie wound up together in the Cathedral Mausoleum at Hollywood forever. And Peter Lorre may be gone, but his legend certainly isn't. He is still widely considered one of the greatest character actors in all of Hollywood history. And he's been parodied so many times through animation, including Ren and Stimpy, the Looney Tunes, that people that have never even seen a Peter Lorre film know the bulgy eyes, know the voice, know the menace. They know him because he's so incredibly iconic. And as an interesting postscript, Peter Lorre's only daughter, Catherine, was walking down Highland in Hollywood in 1977 when two police officers stopped her and started harassing her. In the case of doing so, they found out that she was Peter Lorre's daughter, and they let her go. Of course, it would soon come to be revealed they were not police officers. They were the Hillside Stranglers. They wanted to abduct and murder her. But once they figured out her dad was the great Peter Lorre, they changed their minds. Now, when the killers were abducted, or apprehended rather, they denied the story. They said the area was simply too crowded to risk an abduction. But Peter Lorre's daughter stuck by her story, that it was her famous dad who ultimately saved her life. There are a ton of great Peter Lorre films. Top of my list is definitely M, Casablanca, and The Maltese Falcon, but you really can't go wrong with anything Peter Lorre did because even in his worst movies, he's still the best thing about them. And also, I highly recommend this very, very thick, comprehensive biography about Peter Lorre called The Lost One, A Life of Peter Lorre by Stephen D. Youngkin. I did talk to my friends at Larry Edmonds just today. They confirmed they can order this book for you if you don't already have it. So if you are still stuck in the house during our ongoing quarantine, I highly recommend this book. Full disclosure, I'm still reading it. It's a pretty pretty thick one. It's going to take me a while, but it is excellent, and it is really the definitive look at Peter's life, his career, and, of course, his legend. So I do highly recommend checking out Peter Lorre movies on Turner Classic Movies. There are probably tons of them on streaming. I know there's tons of them on DVD, and I really hope that you'll enjoy discovering this misunderstood but incredibly iconic artist. And that's pretty much it for this week. And again, I always enjoy interacting with all of you on social media. So if you have any comments, if you have questions, if you have requests, and by the way, I am going to get to everybody's requests. Just give me time, but I will get to it. But please let me know and feel free to ask questions. If you live locally and you can get to, get to the cemetery, I really hope to see you on a tour. So thank you so much, and I'll see you next week.